Well, now the question is, what does he do? And that may kind of presage a more violent, more extended, longer, more in-depth attack on Gaza City because he feels that that's what he has to do to redeem himself. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Paradigm Press YouTube channel. My name is Sean Ring. It's my pleasure again to be with Jim Rickards. Um, as you know, Jim is a CIA insider, uh, a, a Pentagon advisor, former investment banker and lawyer. Uh, he's known as the James Bond of investment banking. So he is the absolute perfect man uh, to be talking to about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Jim, welcome back. Sean, it's great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, if you could, if we could keep it as short as possible, sure. what's going on? What, can we just have a brief summary of what's going on right now? Well, we know a lot about what happened, but we're not, it's not as clear what's going to happen next. So the attack, October 7th, um, well, one of the things that was interesting about it, the Hamas attack, uh, it was very low tech. I mean, Hamas does not have an air force. They do not have, uh, you know, uh, armored divisions. But they used, um, you know, paragliders and parasailers, which you can find at any beach resort, uh, to just kind of hop over the fence. A couple of zodiacs to uh, maybe more than a couple for a seaborne uh, attack, and then they used bull. They don't have tanks, but they have bulldozers, and they use bulldozers to hit the fence and create a breach. And then they swarmed in on motorcycles. So you know, it's not like Bradley fighting vehicles and uh, Abrams tanks and. Uh, drones it was bulldozers paragliders and motorcycles but it worked um they got in uh, but from there it was just horrific um they were not looking for israeli defense posts they were not looking to confront the israeli defense forces they were just there to kill civilians so this the civilian dead 1400 uh approximately not collateral damage in a military assault they were the targets uh, and then I don't even really want to talk much about the the manner of the killing. There's a lot available in the media, but this was, um, you know, decapitations, uh, mothers protecting their children. They shot the mother, then they killed the kids, um, you know, rape, uh, mutilation uh, of, of sometimes living captives. They were then killed and then sometimes dead bodies that were just mutilated and worse. So, um that will give uh, anyone the sense of it. This was horror. It was the most Jews killed in a single day since the end of the Holocaust in 1945. Um, and, you know, it, it, I say something like that, and it's it's meant to be impactful and meaningful, although, I don't know, somewhere around the 1990s, I think, at least in the United States, we stopped teaching history. So I don't even know how many younger people appreciate the horror of the Holocaust, but they should, of course. But when you say it's the worst since the Holocaust, that's that's not a throwaway statement. That's meant to uh, convey some of the heart. And I've, I just looked at the um, statistics on the foreign deaths, you know, not nearly as many as the Israelis, of course, but order of magnitude, you know, 20 to 30 or more dead Americans. But also, uh, again, I'll, I'll use approximate numbers and on the exact numbers in front of me, but uh, uh, more than 20 uh, dead from Thailand, um, 21 dead from France, um, 10 dead from the UK, um, Russia, other countries. Not surprising in two respects. Number one, Israel is a very popular tourist destination, pilgrimage, religious pilgrimage definite, uh, destination for all faiths. Um, and uh, a lot of scientists go there, a lot of uh um, you know, experts go there, foreign workers, a lot of the ties were working in Israel, et cetera. So there are 10 or 15 nations around the world that lost 10 or more people in this, including the United States. There seems to be some denial about that. I mean, if if you kill 30 Americans anywhere else, that would be almost a cause for war. But because it was in the context of 1,400 dead Israelis, the U.S. seems to be ignoring it, but it, it's horrific in and of itself. But of course, um, the, the point is, the civilians were not collateral damage. They were the targets, and they weren't just killed. They were killed, raped, tortured, mutilated um, in, a, in a horrific attack. So so that's what we know. Since then, um, Israel has extensively bombed uh, Gaza City. you got to know a little bit about the geography of the Gaza Strip. It's mm -hmm. not that big. It runs along the Mediterranean, the southern borders with Egypt. Uh, the uh, eastern border and the uh, northern border are with Israel. 
Uh, it's completely cut off, no water, no electricity, no food, nothing going in or out. Um, people, uh, the Israelis have warned the Gazans, they said, hey, go south, go to the southern half of the Gaza Strip. They didn't say it in so many words, but that's not in their sights. They are going to invade and attack the northern half. So if you don't want to be a civilian casually, you know, go south. You're talking to about, uh, you know, two million people. It's very densely populated. Perhaps as many as a million have, have actually done that. So now they're crowded into the south. They want to go to Egypt, of course, a, uh, an, um, a small city. Uh, that's one of the entranceways they're called Rafa. Uh, the Egyptians won't let them in. Um, you, you can't blame them. Half of them are in the Muslim Brotherhood, which... Uh, they had to overthrow to get Egypt back on track. Jordan won't let them in. Everyone's like, hey, why won't Jordan let the Palestinians in? Well, the answer is, last time the Palestinians were there, they tried to assassinate the king twice and try to overthrow the regime. And so you had Black, uh, I think it was Black September, was when, when uh, um, the, the, the king Abdullah of Jordan just basically drove them out, sent them to Lebanon, where they still are. That's good. now they're connected with Hezbollah. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a, a, a puzzle. But um, the big question now is when and how will the Israeli ground invasion attack? Uh, everyone expected it within 48 hours. It's coming, but uh, I tell people, you know, you, you got to know a little bit of, uh, Omar Bradley was one of the, uh, um, you know, kind of second only to Eisenhower in terms of planning the D-Day invasion. He said, you know, the armchair generals and the pundits talk about military maneuvers. He said, the real experts talk about logistics. You know, you want to send in tanks, where's the fuel? You want to send in troops? Where's the food? Where's the water? You want to assault places? You got where's the ammunition? You know, et cetera. That those are where the transportation lines, how vulnerable are they? Those are the kinds of things you have to figure out. And assuming that this was oh, this was a surprise attack. I mean, that's this whole separate issue, whether the Israelis should have been taken by surprise, but they were. Um, and so you, you can't do that overnight. So it wouldn't surprise me if it was another, you know, week in the making. Um, but although it could be any days, but that, but that's coming, um, Israeli casualties are going to be high. That's just what urban fighting is all about. You're going block to block and building to building against a force that's had 20 years to entrench themselves. Uh, and so, you know, the Russians have a simple solution for it, which is they just bomb everything to rubble and then go in. Um, I don't think the Israelis are doing a, a smaller version of that, but it's not really an option for them. So you're going to see a really horrific fight. The bigger question, Sean, just to kind of wrap up is, um, does this escalate? Does Hezbollah attack from the north in, into Israel to start a second front? Does Iran get involved because they're the biggest backer of Hezbollah and Hamas? Um, does anyone attack Iran? Uh don't know the answers to all those questions, but they're big questions, and they're really going to determine whether this is uh, a bloody, nasty, brutal fight or a, uh, a prelude to World War III. Well, it, you know, and leading on from that, you just mentioned Iran, and it's it's just fascinating. I, I, one of the last pieces you wrote, President Biden unfroze six billion of Iranian money that was in a South Korean bank, apparently, had it transferred to a Qatari bank for their use, then refroze right. it. Now, one of the things your conclusions was, well, hey, that that shows that the dollar is still a, you know, a weapon. Does it make it even more unloved in that part of the world now? Are they going to? Are other countries going to go? Oh my God, look at this! They're turning, they're, they're flipping the switch on and off. We've got to get out of the dollar now. Right, but both both things are true. The until there's a lot there's a lot in the works. We've talked about it, the BRICS context and other contexts, but until further notice. The dollar does represent um, the currencies for 60% of global reserves, about 80% of global payments, and almost 100% of the oil market. So the dollar is still very powerful. And what you described is a good example of the weaponization of the dollar. I want to come back to that because there's less there than meets the eye. But the response function is exactly what you described, which is if you weren't already trying to get out of the dollar, you are now because uh, as if the um, freezing uh, $250 billion of reserves of the Central Bank of Russia in the Ukraine situation wasn't enough to give you a warning that Iran $6 billion should um, should seal the deal. So uh, it's, it's easier said than done. It takes time. But uh, the what's called the Global South, which is, you know, the BRICS, um, now the BRICS 11, soon to be the BRICS 20, but uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, nations in Central Asia, Eurasian Economic Union, 
nations that align with Russia, also some Eastern European, Central Asian nations, and you know, throw in uh, Brazil, one of the biggest BRICS, Argentina just joined the BRICS, et cetera. We've got a substantial block that are thinking of ways and, and I would say making good progress to getting up under the dollar. I, I've, I've met with the U.S. Treasury. I did a, a tabletop war game at the Pentagon where Treasury, you know, CIA and military and other officials, some think tank people were there. And I warned about this, oh, uh, eight, nine years ago with Treasury officials in the room and they banged the table and tried to shut me down and said, you know, Jim, the dollar is the global reserve currency. It always has been and it always will be, you know, et cetera. And I said, I said, I feel like I'm in Whitehall in 1913 listening to John Bull talk about pound sterling. Um, and um, I, I also make the point that I don't think the world can destroy the dollar, but the U.S. can. We, we're doing it to ourselves uh, by the kind of thing you described. Now, having said that, let's go back to freezing, unfreezing the account. Um, okay, so the $6 billion is in the Qatari bank. It's for the benefit of, of Iran. The U.S. has said to Qatar, you can't let the Iranians spend this. So, yeah, is it a freeze? Kind of, but we're relying on the Qataris, who are friends with Iran and and Hezbollah and Hamas, to do this. So maybe they will. Maybe we can see the see the account transfers. Um, but money is fungible, and if you've got a certain amount of money, and you're like, well, I can spend it on assistance for Hamas or I can spend it in Iran for whatever purpose you want, including military purposes. And I say, hey, there's another $6 billion in the pipeline. Well, even if it's temporarily frozen, it gives me enough confidence to take the money I've got and use it for Hamas, knowing that this money will be coming in sooner than later. And by the way, $6 billion, that's a lot of money, but uh, Obama left a much larger amount, more order of magnitude, more like $40 billion dollars, in cash and gold on pallets, you know, kind of wrapped in saran wrap on the runway in Tehran. Um, and they actually got euros. They got the old 500 euro note um, so that they wouldn't be U.S. dollar bills with serial numbers on them. I mean, euros have, have serial numbers, but just one degree of separation removed from the U.S. dollar and gold, physical gold. So, yeah, six billion is a lot, but that's a drop in the bucket compared to what Obama gave them. Uh, but Obama was OK with that. So when you're looking for explanations, you're like, wow, we're, re we're really doing everything we can to help Iran, giving them money, giving them gold. Uh, we have oil sanctions in place, but we're not enforcing them. And by the way, they're making more money selling oil than they got than the $6 billion. They're make, They made like $70 billion selling oil to China because we never enforced the sanctions. So it looks like we're doing every. And then the, the uh, their main delegate, uh, Obama's choice to lead the negotiations for what's called the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. That was the mm -hmm. Iranian uh, enrichment deal with Iran. Um, that guy, that same individual who was later nominated by uh, Biden to be a special delegate to Iran in the continuing ne negotiations, um, is now under investigation by the FBI as an Iranian spy. And he salted the State Department with pro-Iranian activists. So, okay, so Biden, who's really not much more than a, an empty husk uh, at this point, I mean, the guy can't finish the sentence. I mean, saying, saying a senile is redundant. He can't finish a sentence. Um, it's dangerous and an embarrassment all at the same time. But he flies over there and sits next to Netanyahu, who couldn't, he's reading from, if, he, if you've seen the video clips, he was reading, he had handwritten notes. He was reading from the notes. Couldn't even do that, right? Somebody said today, uh, a, a Biden was hired to do nothing and he can't even do that right. Uh, so uh, it's it just goes from bad to worse. So you have to look at, you say, who's really in charge? You got to say Tony Blinken, Secretary of State, Jake Sullivan, um, National Security Advisor, um, you know, Susan Rice hanging out over a, a for, you know, former White House official, but sort of a uh, envoy from the, from the Obama residence. By the way, Obama is the first president in U.S. history to live in Washington, D.C. after his term of office was over right. because he's basically still running the country. So um, so a lot of this was for show, but Biden can't stand Netanyahu. I'm sure the feeling is mutual. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the same time, Biden said, we're going to give Israel whatever it takes. He said, oh, by the way, we're doing $100 million for the Palestinians, like, as if that money is going to go for uh, 
you know, medicine or food, it's going to go straight to weapons for, for weaponry. So, um, so U.S. foreign policy is a mess. We don't have a president who's our president is non uh, compass mentis. Um, and we have people like Victoria Newland, Jake Sullivan, and Tony Blinken who are intellectual lightweights and warmongers. So none of it's good. I, I, I hate to pile on, but Sean, but uh, it's, um, I just don't see very many good outcomes. And I don't see the talent, the diplomatic talent you need to avoid a worse outcome. That, that's fair enough, Jim. In fact, uh, you know, let's just stick with the American side of things before we go back to Israel. You you just mentioned that President Biden didn't enforce those oil sanctions. I mean, I've, I've got mixed emotions about sanctions anyway. They clearly didn't work with Russia. But this particular instance, the Iranians, as you mentioned, sold all this crude to China for tens of millions of dollars. I was doing research Go for ahead. one of my... One of my billions, yes, of course. I, I was using, I, I was researching for one of my roots this morning, and um, I came across a piece uh, from Pew Research. Seventy-five percent of Jewish Americans vote Democrat. How do you think all of this? Do, do you think? I mean, it's such a huge number. Is there any chance that they flip sides and go red for twenty twenty four? It's a great question. I've I've puzzled over it for decades. Like, you know, the, you said who who saved Israel? I've had various times. The answer is Dwight Eisenhower, Richard Nixon, and Donald Trump. It's always the Republicans who, you know, come up with unequivocal support for Israel. And it's the Democrats who either show weakness or, you know, in the end, they do what they have to do. But in the case of Biden and uh, and uh, Obama, clearly supporting Iran. So, OK, that's the way it is. But if you're an American Jew, why would you vote Democrat? And they do. I mean, you're right about that. Just go down to Miami or, or Manhattan. Um, the The question is, there's a sort of progressive Jew in U.S. politics. They're left wing. They're sort of quasi-socialist. Um, they're not really thinking about, you know, existential crises in Israel. They're not even necessarily, they're Jewish nominally, but some are not even that religious. So... For them, it's kind of a political thing. But but your question is a good one. Is this a wake-up call? It may be. I read an article uh, the other day. It was a good one. It was written by a cousin of Daniel Pearl. Now, Daniel Pearl was a Jew, but he was an investigative journalist for the Wall Street Journal, a good one. And he went to Pakistan to investigate. And it was in Karachi. I've been, you know, I've been to Karachi. It's you know pretty uh, uh, chaotic city. Um and he went there to uh, to look into the roots of Islamic terrorism. There was some event that happened prior, and he was kind of looking into that. Um, and he was kidnapped and beheaded. Now his family, his family. This was uh, I want to say two thousand five, somewhere in there. But I could be off on the exact date. Around two thousand five. His family, instead of like seeking vengeance, they set up the Daniel Pearl Foundation. They encouraged um, outreach to Palestinians. They sponsored cross-cultural music and arts uh, events uh, to encourage, as I say, communication between Israelis and Palestinians. That was, they they took the the peace, love, and understanding approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm not even criticizing. I'm just saying that's what they did. Well, this article is from the cousin who knows the family and has been involved in this efforts and a self-described progressive Jew. Um, and he said, it's over. Uh, he said, I'm out of forgiveness. I got no forgiveness left in the tank. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. Uh, and he happens to be in the Israeli defense forces reserves. And he, he's living in, um, I think Germany, uh, but, you know, contacted the IDF and said, you know, here's my number. Call, call me if you need me, but he's ready to go back into the fight. So so here's the sort of, qu you know, quintessential, smart, upper middle class, well-educated, progressive Jew trying to do outreach of exactly the kind we were describing. And he said, this is the last draw. It's over. It's war. So how that resonates in the U.S., a little hard to say, but I think it will have an impact. Now, let's uh, just 
take it back to Israel just for a second, because this is another thing that I, I wasn't really quite aware of, and I'm just kind of blown away by it. According to the Times of Israel, okay, so this is not, you know, out of any of our, you know, conspiracy laden theories or anything like that. Times of Israel, okay, um, alleges and, and said that Benjamin Netanyahu has been allowing the Qataris to fund Hamas to keep the Palestinian Authority at bay. So there's no two state solution that would ever be reached. Is this the end for Bibi now? It depends on how the war goes from here, but but it may be. So he, um, it, it, I don't think it comes as a shock that uh, the Israelis viewed Hamas, you know, as horrific as they were in this attack, that basically divided the Palestinian people. This is, you know, this is, you know, uh, colonialism 101, which is divide and rule. Uh, the British figured it out and they did it very successfully for a long time. So, um, so if you have two groups representing the Palestinian people, the Palestinian Authority, and Hamas, and for that matter, if you want to say three, if you include Hezbollah, that means there is no unified Palestinian voice. And again, I've, I've been all over these areas. I've been in the West Bank. I've been I've crossed into Palestinian territory. Uh, I've been on the Golan Heights with uh, IDF forces, you know, Humvees with 50 caliber machine guns, minefields, barbed wire fences, no man's land. Uh, I've been in the Dead Sea. I've been um, uh, you know, up and down Israel, Jordan, um uh you know egypt of course so i've been in the neighborhood uh and, and uh it's um uh you know it's a very rough neighborhood by the way uh what border walls work the israelis build a border wall along between the west bank and the main part of israel and it works fine uh it ended the second intifada because you know, they were bringing terrorists across so don't let anyone tell you that walls don't work they work fine um but so a little bit cynical, but yeah, supporting Hamas to some extent or encouraging Qatar and Iran to support Hamas as a way to divide the Palestinians. It's also been reported, and I think reliably, that Netanyahu had a little bit of a heads up from Egyptian intelligence and perhaps his own intelligence people uh, and other sources that some kind of attack was coming. Now, to be fair, saying, hey, something's up or an attack's coming uh, if you don't know exactly when, it's like, oh, yeah, well, okay, they've been attacking us for 80 years. What else is new? That's not the same as knowing the low tech tactics and the fact that they were out to kill civilians. That's they're not the same. But uh, was Israel um, not just caught by surprise, but maybe well, clearly an intelligence failure, clearly a military failure? I was reading about one. Uh, kibbutz that was um, has weapons. <laughs> also, good argument against gun control. By the way, you ought to have weapons for weird situations. Um, but one kibbutz, say they had them in a locker. They passed out the rifles. The gate was closed. The the inside of the kibbutz, they're they're fending off uh, the Hamas. But Hamas kept coming and kept attacking. The military forces were nowhere to be found. They're calling the army. They can't. You no, know, it's chaos. And somebody says, and they're defending themselves. But somebody says, why don't we call the police? And they did. And the police showed up with like a SWAT team. And then the combination of the Kibbutzim and the, the police, they did get Hamas did retreat. So um, that's the kind of, uh, you know, again, chaos and unpredictable outcomes you were expecting. But clearly, the military were, were not alert. The intelligence, there was an intelligence failure. Um, and I won't dispute the fact that Netanyahu had some kind of heads up, but it probably it could not have had the specificity that we we now know happened. Um, but um, so that puts him behind the April. Now the question is, what does he do? Um, and that may kind of presage a more violent, more extended, longer, more in-depth attack on Gaza City because he feels that that's what he has to do to redeem himself. So I, 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 I don't know. We're mixing up politics geopolitics and violence in the same formula but uh without knowing the outcome my initial assessment would be that they're going to go in with a lot of force and have a lot of israeli casualties and you know probably in the tens of thousands of uh palestinian casualties and they're just going to try to wipe out hamas i guess finally let's um let's just turn to oil um you know you you wrote recently that in the short run, the Persian Gulf still open. Okay. And, and again, in, for those of you watching who 
uh, didn't see Jim's uh, speech in Vegas, fantastic speech on the bricks and the choke points of which the Strait of Hormuz is one um, that the bricks now control, thanks to the UAE and Saudi and Iran. Uh, but the Persian Gulf still open, so we haven't seen oil. We saw a pop in oil, but it hasn't hit triple digits yet or had some outrageous move. Um, you said it's probably going to be steady around here for the foreseeable future. What do you see for the long run into 2024? Well, it depends on whether the war escalates. So, um, so what I said is, you know, when the, when the war broke out, at least some commentators are like, oh, oil's going to 100, then 120, and all, all that. Uh, the fact is, there are, absent the war, and it's, it's a big uh, um, exception, but just put it to one side for the moment, the trend in oil prices should be down. A lot of other things are deflating. There's strong disinflation. The economy's slowing. Um, you know, the second quarter numbers are going to be, uh, so our third quarter numbers are going to be okay, but that's because there was a lot of strength in July, um, you know, coming out, of, uh, coming out of the second quarter, but it was driven by consumers drawing down their savings and using up their credit cards. Uh, but there are limits to that, like your savings go to zero and your credit card is capped out. And so you, that's it. Um, then the interest starts compounding at 20% and you triple the principal and, you know, double the principal in three years. And, and that, you know, doesn't end well. Um, so it looks like the consumer kind of hit the brakes in beginning around mid-August into September. Gasoline consumption is down. Uh, and that demand is pretty inelastic, but uh, if it's down, it means that people are, they're just traveling less. They're just not using as much gasoline. So that and a lot of other factors, uh, including the fact that Iran's pumping away and Saudi Arabia's, uh, you know, the Saudi Arabia put a little cap on production to support the price. But the fact that they did that tells you that the price wants to go lower. So the macro picture is that oil prices should be lower, but they're not. And the reason is right now is because the uncertainty surrounding the Israeli war. So I see the war between Israel and Hamas. It's not that oil prices are soaring, but they should probably be coming down and they're not. So it's really put a floor under prices. Right. So this 85 to $88 barrel uh, per barrel price um, you know, it should be down in the 70s, but it's not. So so it's put a floor under it. Now the question is, does it spike for other reasons? And the reasons would be escalation of the war. Does Hezbollah open a second front? Does um, Iran get involved? Uh, I mean, Iran's already involved. I mean, it's just it's all behind the curtain. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're providing – Hamas doesn't have a satellite network, but Iran does. And if you can use the spy satellites to provide intelligence, then that's valuable. Uh, so Iran's already doing that sort of thing, but um, do they get directly involved, uh, particularly with he Hezbollah is much more of an Iranian client than Hamas. Hamas gets aid, but Hez Hezbollah is basically the, um, the the Mediterranean army of Iran, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and, um, you know, Chris, uh, Trump um, assassinated the head of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, named Soleimani. So, um uh, but Biden's done nothing of the sort. So, uh, so Iran's already involved. Do they get more involved? Number one, does Israel feel they have to strike Iran, uh, et cetera? Anything like that will send oil to 120, then 150, and kind of who knows beyond there. So I would say short run, we have a floor in a world where it would otherwise be declining, but it's not. So we have a floor. Uh, so it's an asymmetric trade where it's not going to go down, but it could go up. And the potential for it to go up depends entirely on whether the war escalates and whether Iran gets directly involved. But if it does, then forget the Persian Gulf and, um, you know, and uh, the world's going to a whole, whole different level. Jim, once again, it's brilliant to sit here and listen to your golden nuggets. Thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom with us. And thank you, everyone for joining us today. Have a great one.